Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective, as we study the rapture in Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation side by side. And before we continue, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought, a comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. This is video 52 of our in-depth study of eschatology, the study of end times with a focus on the rapture. Now I begin this this study <clears throat> proving or making my case for the pre-tribulation rapture, which entails when the rapture will happen before the tribulation period, the great tribulation period, or in the middle of the great tribulation period, or at the end of the great tribulation period. Now, the tribulation period is a seven-year period of time in which God is also known as the day of the Lord, that God will, <coughs> excuse me, uh, judge the sinful world, culminating with his return to set up his earthly kingdom. Now, the rapture is a separate event. It is Jesus himself returning or coming to receive his church. Now, the, the debate is when will the rapture happen? As I said, some people believe it would happen at the end of the tribulation period. Some believe it would happen in the middle of the tribulation period. And some people, like myself, believe that the church has to be raptured before the tribulation period begins. Now, in fairness, and I say this in every video, none of the positions have a clearly stated scripture that says when the rapture is going to happen. There is a clearly stated scripture that the rapture will happen, but there's none that clearly states before the tribulation middle of the tribulation, or at the end of the tribulation. So while I, I firmly believe and hold to the pre-tribulation period, I have to you know, concede that there is no clearly stated verse. So with that, I would say, I would exhort, let's just hold to our opinions, debate it, you know, argue it, but at the end of the day, agree to be disagreeable in love in Christ. And I say this again all the time too, because you'd be surprised at how vicious and belligerent people become over this issue, and they shouldn't. I mean, it's just an opinion. Now, we also have been studying Matthew 24 alongside of the book of Revelations. And today we've studied all the way up to chapter 19, which we will get back to. I did that because again, I, I and one again, this this whole in-depth series in teaching is that to be able to um look at all or as many of the end time prophecies as we can. I think one of the mistakes, and I've made it before, which is why I decided to do this in this this in-depth study. Because I do reaction videos on post millennialism, uh, whatever the you know tribulation, uh, I mean end time uh, you know prop videos, I do reactions on them, and so we always kind of uh, we're limited to how deep we can get, and that's not good. Secondly, whatever view you have, because that's the view that I haven't really dealt with, I deal with it in a another set of videos and that is post-millennialism um, all millennialism and preterism and and that's a category by itself because of the method that they use to interpret scripture basically they say you know the scriptures are allegorical and symbolic and 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 and, and thus that's how you interpret the verses of the scriptures or well, that's what I say. I don't. I don't get into that. But even with the other views, what I would argue 
is you cannot construct your theology, your opinion, from just a few of uh, sets of verses. And, and, and I think most people do. So, like I say, we have been looking at a cross-section of all of the verses. And then we, we understand, we can get an understanding, and after 52, this is not 50, after 51 videos, as I said, um, we got a pretty good, clear, we, we have a pretty good understanding of what the end time prophecies said. Now, I, I'm going to, after I finish up with my side-by-side -side study of the book of Matthew and, and Revelation, I am going to come back and then do a final recap of the rapture and again why I believe it has to happen before the tribulation period. And the reason why I wanted to study Revelations and Matthew side by side because uh, I, I, the, the outlay, the format of the teaching is the same. Both given by Jesus. And you see a certain format where Jesus first addresses the church and then he shifts us back to the great tribulation period and then talks about his second coming. <clears throat> we see the same thing in the book of Revelation, just a little longer. The first three chapters talks Jesus' message to the church. And then from chapters 6 to 19, you see the great tribulation period. You see the judgments of Jesus. And then at the and then in, in chapter 19, you see the return of Jesus. And then you go on into the millennial reign. And so we we, we have been we're gonna cover some of that. And we have been covering some of this um verses. So with that, let me uh let's get back into it. And um, I think I want to close out chapter 19 and go into the millennial reign, kind of finish up with that. So here we go. Okay. <clears throat> now, last time, remember, <clears throat> I I'm going to start, I'm going to pick up again, side by side with Matthew 24 and, and Revelation 19. <clears throat> I want to just kind of scroll through some of what we talked about um as far as the in the, the tribulation period itself um so verse 15 again says so when you see the abomination that called this desolation spoken by the prophet daniel standing in the holy place then he said let the reader understand now this tells us this is the the great tribulation period in fact he said verse 21 for at that time there would be great tribulation the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now or never uh, will again and never will again unless those days were limited no one would survive but in but those days <coughs> excuse me uh will be limited because of the elect now the, the the elect here refers to israel in this in this in this context um some people want to make this the church now the word elect refers to the chosen okay it's, that's basically it's chosen and like a lot of words for example like salvation salvation simply means delivered so then you have to say what is the context in which now that word is used so for example david used the word salvation the lord save me from my enemies the lord save me from my distress but then we also have, the, of course, Jesus saving us from our sins, saving us from the wrath of God. What are, the, the term elect is used in various ways. The, the root word meaning chosen. So in the Old Testament, it's exclusively referred to Israel as the chosen. chosen. And then in the New Testament, it can refer to Israel as it is here. And then also in Paul's epistles, it can refer to the, both the church, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, Israel, again, depending on the context. 
So we looked at that last time and we kind of established that to show you how when he refers to the elect. And then as we come down to verse 29, and he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not shed its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the celestial powers will be shaken, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all of the people of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, excuse <coughs> me, from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. And we said the elect here again is the not the church. Now some people use this word elect as the church. But as we said, it's not, it is referring to Israel. <clears throat> and then we looked at, of course, and again, I, at the end of this, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend more time at the end of our session here. Going back over my case, after all of these videos, I'm going to come back. I'm going to end it with me making my case again for the um, the, the, the pre-tribulation rapture position. This verse does not refer to the rapture when he said he would send out his angel with a loud trumpet and they would gather the elect. The difference is that Jesus himself is coming for the church. Okay, that's the difference. Now, back to the, 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 the coming, the second coming. So the rapture of the church is Jesus himself coming for the church. We will meet him in the air. But here, notice he says the sign of the, verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the people of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he would send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they would gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now, we looked at several verses of the scripture in the Old Testament that describes this, ver this, this happening here. When he says, the coming of the Lord, and then uh, gathering the elect. This is kind of, kind of going over into the millennial reign. Okay. So what I want to do is quickly show, go to a verse before I go to Revelation. Um, uh, let's go back to Zechariah chapter 14. <coughs> Zechariah chapter 14. Okay. So he says here, a day of the Lord is coming. Now, I you know what uh well, let me see if i can get this back one oh all right um let me do it this way i'll go over here i want to show you something from matthew 24 side by side with zachariah 14. okay Um, all right, so let's take a look at this. I want you to see this side by side. Matthew 24, and let's go back and start at verse 15. So when you see the abomination that caused this desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. We studied this, Daniel nine uh daniel eight daniel seven daniel twelve he said then those in judea must flee to the mountains a man on the house now again so he's talking about israel and what's going to happen with israel he said the man on the house housetop must not come down to get things out of his house a man in the field must not go back to get his clothes woe to the pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days Pray that your escape may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For at that time, there would be great tribulation, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never again will be unless those days were limited. No one would survive, but those days will be limited because of the elect. Now, let's take a look at another prophecy in Zechariah. 
chapter 14, he says, a day of the Lord is coming. Now, we studied plenty of scriptures that talks about or that define the term, the day of the Lord. It refers to a day, a time period in which God will judge the earth. It also refers to a time that applied to God judging Israel, such as the Babylonian invasion, the Assyrian invasion, a day of the Lord. But this particular day of the Lord is, is during the tribulation period, the events leading up to the tribulation period, and also the coming of the Lord. So he says here, a day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided in your presence. And then he says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured, the houses looted, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be removed from the city. So we, we saw side by side when in Matthew, he talked about, right, when you see the abomination that makes desolation. So in other verses of scripture that we studied, Revelation 13, the, the, the reign of the beast, he will come hard against Israel. We see some of the the brutality that will that will happen to Israel, right? This horrible time. Now you also should know that this time happens because of Israel's sins. So you know, if you remember in Daniel chapter nine, when he talks about the seventy weeks, one of the things he said was to seal up the vision, to put it in the sin. Okay, so there's a couple of things that's going on, not only in the world, but also that God is also judging Israel, cleansing Israel. So that's why, so then verse three says, then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fought on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley so that half of the mountain will move to the north and half to the south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for the valley of the mountains will extend to Ezel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of, of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all of his holy ones with him. On that day, there will be no light. The sunlight or the moonlight will be, will will diminish, diminish. It will be a day known only to Yahweh, without day or night, and there will be there will be light at evening. I want to skip this part because it talks. Uh, we're going to get back to this when we get to Revelation chapter twenty, um, and then verse twelve. It says, "Cause this is you know, verse twelve says, this will be the plague." that the Lord strikes all the peoples with, who have warred against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouth. On that day, a great panic from the Lord will be among them, so that each will seize the hand of another, and the hand of one will rise against the other. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be collected, gold, silver, clothing, and great abundance. The same plague as previous will strike uh, the horses, the mules, camels, um, donkeys, and all of the animals that are in the camp. Now, I'm going to stop here because I'll, I'll come back to this when we get into the Again, millennial reign. But I want you to see something here as the picture of the Lord when he comes. What will happen? What will he do when he comes? All right. So let's. Uh, so let me just go here. Look at this again. So you see side by side when he says, when you see the abomination that called the desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in a holy place. And, 
those in Judea must flee to the mountain. The man on the housetop must not come down to get his things out of the house. And the man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. Both to the pregnant women, nursing mothers in those days, pray that your escape may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For at that time there would be great tribulation, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now, never again will be. Now, you can see why such great tribulations. I want to show you another verse of scripture in Ezekiel. And I'm going to have to hunt for this too. Which I should have had this beforehand, my apologies. So let's say, let's, uh, Start with 37. Um, uh, let me see here. I've got to search for this one of the particular ones I want to show you. And this is when the Lord comes. Now, what I'm scrolling through, this is a very famous verse of the Valley of the Dry Bones. I guess I can read some of this. It will, uh, it's going to go hand in hand with what we're talking about anyway. Verse 37, verse 1 says, Then uh, the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by his spirit, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. Now, remember, he said he would gather his elect right from the four winds. He said, um, so here's a kind of another view, a view of that. He led me around them. And there was a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? I replied, Lord God, you know, he said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. And I will put tendons on you, make, make flesh grow on you and cover your skin, cover you with skin. And I'll put breath in your mouth so that you become the life. And you will know that I am Yahweh. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. While I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. As I looked up, as I looked, tendons appeared on them. Flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says. Breath come from the four winds, now that's kind of interesting, right? And breathe in, into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied, and he, as I commanded, and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Look how they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished, we are cut off. So I'm gonna skip down because he talks about again, God gathering Israel. Um, let's see. Um, all right, look at verse 38. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, turn your face to God. In the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and, and, and uh, Tubal, prophesy against them and say, this is what the Lord God says. Look, I'm against you, God, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with, a, with all of your army, with all of your ar army, including horses and riders who are all splendidly dressed, a huge company armed with shields and bucklers, all them bra uh, brandishing swords, Persia, Kush, and push, put over them, all of them with shields, uh, helmets, Gomer, and all the troops, Beth Tegama, uh, Togama, uh, from the remotest parts of the north, all along with all these troops, many people with you. Now, uh, I'm not going to get too deep into a lot of the interpretations here that some people think this is Russia. The land of Gog, okay, um, or Magog, would 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 rep, seem to represent the land of the north, which would which would be Russia. But he also lists some other um, 
nations such as Persia, Kush, Put, which these are more Middle Eastern nations all down to some parts of Africa. Okay. Um, but you can see this army. Oh, this is a kind of an end time. This is what's going to happen at the end time. We're going to go to Revelation 19 and see and yet another picture of this. Um, oh, so um, let's see here. This I want to read uh, the disposal. Um, let's see. Let's pick it up verse 17. This is what the Lord God says. Are you the one I spoke about in former times through my servants, the prophets of Israel, who for years prophesied in those times that I will bring you against them? Now on that day, the day when Gog comes against the land of Israel, this is the declaration of the Lord God, my wrath will flare up, I swear in my zeal and fury rage. On that day, there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Now, again, we saw this prophesied in Zechariah, okay? <clears throat> By the way, Zechariah is a time frame that's much later than Ezekiel. He says, the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals of the field, every creature that crawls on the ground, every human being on the face of the earth would tremble before me. The mountains would be thrown down, the cliffs will collapse, and every wall will fall to the ground. And I will call for the sword against him on all of my mountains, the declaration of the Lord God, and every man swore will be against his brother. And I will execute judgment on him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour out a torrential rain, hailstones, fires, brimstones on him. Remember the remember this 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 description here: rain, hailstones, and fire and brimstones on him, as well as his troops and many people who are with him. And I will just I will display my greatness and holiness, and will reveal my great myself in the sight of many nations. They will know that I am Yahweh. Um. There's, oh, some of this, let me read this uh, as it goes into the, um, the millennial reign. So I'm, I'm reading you this now so that when we go to the book of Revelation, you will also have this along with what we read in Zechariah as comparison. Um, okay, let's, uh, verse 39 says, As for you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, This is what the Lord God says. Look, I'm against you, Gog, chief prince of Mesha, uh, Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, drive you on, and lead you up from the remotest parts of the north, and I will bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock your bow from, from your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand, and all your troops and the people who are with you will fall on the mountains of Israel. And I will give you food to every kind of predatory bird and to the wild animals you will fall on the open field, if I have spoken. This is the declaration of the Lord. And I will send fire against Magog and those who live securely on the coast and the islands. Then they will know that I am Yahweh. So I will make my holy name known among my people, Israel, and will no longer allow it to be profaned. Then, then, then the nations will know that I am Yahweh and the Holy One of Israel. Yes, it is coming. And it will happen. This is the declaration of, of the Lord God. This is the day I've spoken about. Then the inhabitants of the of Israel cities will go out, kindle fires, and burn the weapons, and the buckler, the shields, the bow, the arrow, <clears throat> the clubs, the spears. For seven years, they will use them to make fires. In other words, this great army will be destroyed, and all of their armory, uh, weaponry will be used as fire. He said, they will not gather wood from the countryside or cut it down. 
from the forest, for they were used used the weapons to make fire. Then they would take loot from those who looted them and plunder those who plundered them. This is a declaration of the Lord God. Now, obviously, we're getting a a a, a snapshot, an image, because as we know now, some twenty five hundred years after the prophecy. We have more modern modern weaponry, okay. Um, so, so the landscape will certainly look a lot different than is prophesied here, verse eleven. Now, on that day, I will give God a burial place there in Israel, the valley of the travelers, east of the seas, that will block those who travel through. For Gog and all his hordes will be buried there, so it will be called the valley of. Ham and Gog, the house of Israel would spend seven months burying them in order to cleanse the land. And all the people of the land will bury them and their fame will spread. On that day I display my glory. This is a declaration of the Lord. They will appoint men on a full-time basis to pass through the land and bury the invaders who remain on the surface of the ground in order to cleanse it. They will make their search at the end of seven months when they pass through the land and one of them and and one of them sees a human bone, he will set up a marker next to it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Ham and Gog. There were there will even be a city named uh Hamora there, so they will cleanse the land. The Son of Man, uh this is what the Lord God says to every kind of bird and all the wild animals assembles, uh, assemble and come, gather all around my sacrificial feast that I'm a, that I am slaughtering for you, a great feast on the mountains of Israel. You will eat, you will eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the earth's princes, rams, lambs, goats, and all the fatted bulls of Bashan. You will eat. You will eat fat until you are satisfied and drink blood until you are drunk at my sacrificial feast I have prepared for you. At my table, uh, you will eat uh, your uh, fill of horses, raiders of the mighty men and warriors. This is the declaration of the Lord. So this great feast is one of um, when God will destroy uh, the nations of the world who come against Israel during the end times. Um, I am missing something here, but okay. So, um, let me go back. So, All right, let's go back. So we saw the same thing in, in uh, I'm going to go to Book of Revelations now. Now I'm showing you different verses. Um, come on now. All right, I'm showing you different, uh, prophetic scriptures so that you could we see the continuity of what god is saying and why so that now when we come here to what he's describing we see the continuity now this is the second coming so let me pick it up at verse 11 okay And he says, then I saw heaven, then, then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. It rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. Now, let me just say this. I'm not going to, uh, like I told you, on a different category, I, you, you deal with preterism and different, uh, that category, the, that theology, preterism, postmillennialism. Um, because in, in one of their theologies, they, they teach that Jesus is coming back to a welcoming world. They teach that Jesus 
that the that that the church will win most of the world, if not all of the world, and then that that is the world that Jesus is coming back to. And you just just make note of how silly that is. Just what we read as far as the end times. Um, of course, some of them will say that it. it Preterism said that I think some of this stuff already happened. Like I said, not to get too far into that. What all I, I'm just taking the opportunity to say because there's there's probably a lot more people that that believe in post millennialism than you think, and yet he, here is a good scripture for them to say. Well, you need to understand. You you have, you have to explain this, right? You have to explain this. Um. Jesus is coming back. Notice he said to make war, <laughs> not to a welcoming cloud, I mean crowd of already saved people. Verse 12, his eyes were like a fiery flame and many crowns on his head. He had a name written that no no one knows except himself. And he wrote and, and he wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure and white linen. linen. Uh, a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he may strike the nations with it and he will shepherd them with an iron an iron scepter and he will also trample the wine press the first anger of God Almighty and he has the name written written on his robe and on his side King of Kings and Lord of Lords now so just think about this picture here as, as you see Jesus second coming. So remember what we kind of read thus far. Jesus is coming. Every eye will see him. And notice the earth will mourn. Now we know why. He is coming uh, with vengeance. He is coming to execute God's wrath on the ungodly. Now, if you remember chapters 13, um, chapters, uh, all the, 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 the beast, how ungodly people will be. We just read that how that the armies will attack Israel um, and and really, really uh, um, afflict harm on them. Houses will be looted, women raped. Um, you so now as he comes, this is the second coming of Jesus. So now. He makes the statement he um, will shepherd them with a iron scepter. We'll get more than that in the in the description prophetically of this the reign of Christ when he comes. So notice he says he will trample the wine press of the first anger of God, the Almighty. Verse 17, then I saw an angel standing in the on the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying over, overhead, Come gather for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and their riders, and the flesh of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. Now, again, we, we see the incredible sinfulness of man that, think about this, 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 I firmly believe this during this time, there will not be atheists. And one of the reasons why, like now you see that atheists they are uh, they form their beliefs through a paradigm a paradigm that they fight a religious paradigm christianity the foremost but uh, really it's, it, it, they don't believe in any god and atheists do not believe in any god and so um if you remove that paradigm as you will see during this time and the bible says all the world will worship the beast he will deceive all the world. But understand that this is a willful deception that they will willfully worship the beast. It's, it's going to be like what? Three kind of 
actually four figures. <laughs> you may, the fourth figure, you're going to have the beast, you're going to have the false prophet, and then they, they will worship the dragon who gives the beast its authority. Now you'd say, well, what's the fourth beast? Well, remember, the, the false prophet is going to make an image to the beast that they will also worship. And he, this image will speak as if it has life. So now he says, uh, so then I, he said, then the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his armies, right? So we see now what happens with that, that they are, that, let's go on. I'm getting ahead of myself. But the beast was taken prisoner along with him, the false prophet who had performed signs in his presence. He deceives those and accept the mark. He, he deceives those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worship his image with this with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on his horse. And all of the birds were filled uh, with their flesh. Now, so. We kind of get this picture now of the second coming and what will happen, okay? The second coming and what will happen. Every eye will see him. Oddly enough, the the beast will gather his armies and will say, okay, it's on. Let's, yeah, let's rumble, right? And the armies that come, when Jesus come, he's just going to wipe them out with the sword of his mouth. In Zechariah, we saw where their, their eyes melt and rot in their, in their face, just on their skin. The power of God that will destroy the armies, the wicked armies of the earth. And then all of the birds will just gorge themselves on these on this flesh. We also saw that they will pick them clean. And all this is going to happen on the mountains of Israel. And for seven months, think about this, for seven months, all of the weaponry will be gathered and used as fire. There will be full-time grave diggers that will go through the land and just mark where all the bones are. And then they will spend full time grave diggers burying these bones, he says, so that the land would be cleansed. So that 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 is the event of when Jesus comes. Now, we're going to get into now chapter 20 of Revelations about this. When So now that Jesus is here, well, now, what is he going to do? Well, first, you see, he evicts the evil people of the earth. And notice, they come to fight him. They're, they're not coming. They will see him in the sky, but they will not worship him. And that is something we saw, remember, throughout the book of Revelation. I said, notice how increasingly wicked and hardened they become. They know God is the one afflicting them, and yet they become even more hardened. Now, when Jesus comes, so you see that at this final conflict with the beast, that the arrogance to think that they could destroy him. That's why I say it's not going to be atheism during that time. They will know who they're attempting to fight. They will know who they, who they will come to destroy or attempt to destroy, right? And they will be immediately uh, just wiped out. And that's amazing. You know, the, the hardness of sin that makes me cringe because I'm, I'm thanking God for his mercy on me. But oftentimes people ask, how can such a loving God send people to hell? I just gave you a picture. We just, he gives us a picture, right? The prophecy of how they will react 
and they're trying to destroy, you know, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and, and remember, they're coming to fight the King of Kings. It, it, it won't be an issue of whether or not he exists or not. They will see him and they will still try to destroy him. So when people ask, how can a loving God destroy us? Well, he's also a just God and he is going to render justice. All right, guys, don't forget to like and share this video. And subscribe to BP to Bible Perspectives. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. And I will see you in part 53 of Rapture in the Rapture in Depth. All right, guys. See you next time.